It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker today, Julia Ross, has 40 years of experience as a licensed psychotherapist with 30 years of pioneering work in the field of nutritional therapy. She is the author of the best-selling books, The Mood Cure and The Diet Cure, and she is now launching her new book, The Craving Cure. Please join me in welcoming Julia Ross. Thank you. I'm delighted, really, to be here. I've been in my pajamas for the last four years, um, writing this tome. <laughs> um, this is the first time I've been to an East Coast Weston A. Price event in probably 15 years. Um, the first time I came was not long after I'd met Sally. Uh, we both showed up at a Monsanto um, panel. We didn't know each other and began to barrage them separately from two sides of the room with <laughs> challenges and questions and facts and so forth. And uh, thank you. I need to plug that into your laptop. You want to? Yes. Thank you. My um, computer is not happy. <laughs> that should help okay. you click through your slides better. Oh, great. And Thank you. A laser on the front of it, so if you want to point at something. So just click that. Yep, forward, nice backwards. Yes, ma'am. Uh, don't and this the is the That's a laser. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Where was, was I? Monsanto. <laughs> so, uh, Could I have an assistant with a towel <laughs> and, and another glass of water that I'll put somewhere else? Uh. Anyway, uh, we became immediate buddies and uh, repaired to the, this was in Las Vegas, <clears throat> we repaired to the restaurant at the top of the mountain outside of Las Vegas that serves only uh, wild game, in case you wondered if there was anything worth going to Las Vegas about. Uh, uh, this is a great place. And uh, I got, you know, some sort of bird, and it was totally flavorless. And she said, well, just put a lot of butter on it. I said, oh, my. I said, oh. <laughs> she really is up my alley. Um, oh, that would be even better. Probably. Yes. It was a small glass of water, but it's a waterfall here. Uh, yeah, maybe better. Those nap the cloth napkins don't absorb very well. Yeah, that'd be great. Can I give these to you? Thank you. Um, So my dazzling introduction is uh, being impaired, but uh, uh, oh, thank you. That would really impair it. Uh, <laughs> what I was leading up to was um, that from my vantage point, um, talking to people on a daily basis, hearing about cases, dozens of cases every week of people coming in desperate for help, um, the Weston A. Price, all of you, um, are a bastion, you know, a, in a sinking world. Um, Weston A. Price is an island, really. Um, and I regard my job uh, as assisting you um, because the answer really is in our historical past. You know, it's fading fast. Only people like me at 73 can even remember uh, before 1970 when we were living a relatively traditional 
life uh, in terms of our diet. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I was considering calling this whole day um, approaching the apocalypse. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you understand why. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm seriously uh, worried about it. Uh, and the dietary apocalypse is, you know, my particular concern. And uh, really, we don't have time for any more new dietary trends. We don't have time for any long-term strategies. Um, we don't have time to pass all the laws to tax all the foods that need to be taxed. Um, what we really need uh, is a miracle. Um, something fast. Something that can be exported worldwide um, as our toxic foods are being exported worldwide and as they're destroying the world, we need to follow it up with something miraculous that will um, neutralize the toxic spell that the world is, is being um, imperiled by. Uh, and um, before I get too dis uh, depressing uh, about the condition of the world, I just want to say that that miracle is at hand. And um, I'm going to share it with you today. Uh, it's, not a, it's an old miracle, actually. Um, I learned about it 30 or so years ago in 1986 and really started using it in 1988 with all of our clients. Um, the good news about this old miracle is that uh, I know it works and I'm not uh, passing it on to you casually, uh, as you'll see. So let me put the book down in the lake here. Uh, well, maybe I won't. So let's look at this. Uh, for I don't suppose there's a mic I could wear around. Um, what'd you find out? I'm uh, really apt to wander around, so uh, I don't think I've ever been at a stationary mic in years. Um, so let's look at uh, what we're up against here. Just briefly, I promise I won't go into the gory details for terribly long, but um, I think you get the message. Um, I wanted to start with an image of someone uh, who is clearly in the grips uh, of a craving, or it's gripping her is more like it. Um, and that's really the point that I want to get across to you. as people at this particular event, you are less likely to be in this particular grip uh, than, than most rooms full of people that, that I've been speaking to over the years. Uh, but my experience is that even people who can get a grip on traditional foods and begin to see their cravings for junk foods receding often are left with some vestige of those cravings. Um, and so my job for you personally is to hopefully relieve you of whatever vestiges are still uh, uh, burdening you, uh, but more to give you tools that you can use with everyone around you. Um, I know I had dinner with several people um, uh, Thursday night, um, was that only Thursday night? Yeah. And they were all, you know, chapter leaders and so forth. And, uh, and they were all talking about how clear they are 
about whatever their food restrictions are, whatever the foods they're eating or not eating, uh, that they're glowing with health and energy, uh, but the people around them regard them as freaks. Um, so I want you to have uh, a tool to fight back with because those people who regard you as freaks are in defensive mode. They know that you're doing the only thing that makes any sense, but uh, they can't do it. They can't join you. Um, those foods are beyond their reach. For those of you who can't see the... Would you like to have the screen raised? <laughs> She's, it's a good thing they had two assistants for this uh, particular event. So what this says is traditional foods behind bars. And, you know, in creating this image, I really wanted to help you understand people who can't be in this room yet, um, who admire you maybe, even though they don't admit it, but can't join you. Um, and the word is C-A-N-T. Um, and... The point of this particular presentation is so that you can understand these other people who can't do this. They're not stupid, um, but they're experiencing cravings that they can't say no to. How are you doing back there? Is that any better at all? Most of the words are not going to be at the bottom. Yeah. Thank you for trying. Thank you. Um, so these millions in this country are now joined by, of course, millions elsewhere. And I just wanted to give you uh, what happened. There's one missing. <laughs> Let's start with us. Uh, why am I here? What is, uh, you know, why... What's wrong with eating junk food anyway? It tastes great, it's cheap, it's readily available, everybody else does it, it's really fun. Um, so uh, the reason is that um, although in 1968, 30% of us were overweight, and by the way, that was the first decade where there was any weight uh, gain. As a matter of fact, it was the first decade where they ever measured weight. In the United States, we never measured weight before the 1960s. That was not an issue. Um, if any of you can remember or have heard about the 1950s <laughs> and 40s, I'll show you pictures. Uh, weight was not an issue when I was in uh, grammar school and high school. The body shape uh, was not of interest to anyone, and we had quite a variety. Uh, there were little tiny people and, you know, normal-sized people and then tall people and uh, females. But nobody cared about that. What was important was personality. Can you imagine a world where it didn't matter? Uh, because everybody understood that their body shape was the same as their eye color. It was an involuntary fact. It had nothing to do with willpower or character. Uh, so <clears throat> back then in the uh, 60s, um, there was starting to be some concern about weight gain for the first time ever in the United States. And uh, of the overweight, 30% overweight, 10% were obese. Uh, now, they weren't entirely sure whether any of this had been going on before and maybe these were normal high range weights. However, uh, the determination was made that, that there was some excessive uh, weight accumulating. It was actually less than 1% of diabetes in those days. Um, so uh, let's, uh, for the brave hearted, go to the column under 2018 and you'll see that 80% of us, 80%, that was this year's statistic, last year it was 70, 
Uh, anyone for an obesity rate? <laughs> so now, uh, now we're up from 30%. Um, a few years ago to 50%. And most of the people who are categorized as obese um, are morbidly obese, so that their, their health is very significantly at risk. And finally, California did a very thorough assessment and discovered that, and I'm from California, that 50% uh, of us um, are being diagnosed with some form of diabetes, you know, some type 1, lots of pre-diabetes, type 2, and of course, type 2 confirmed. Um, so that's from point, point, point 0.9, which was really what it was um, in the early 60s, um, to 50 percent. Um, They've been calling it an, a galloping epidemic since the 1990s. Uh, you can see why. So this year, uh, an international study found that 12% of breast cancer is exclusively associated with junk food consumption, uh, consumption of ultra-processed foods. Uh, we used to think processed was pretty insulting, you know. <laughs> but ultra-processed, and we'll talk a little bit about what does that mean. 30% um, of us are uh, now suffering something that nobody really ever suffered before, and that's the liver disease, non-alcoholic liver disease. It's really cirrhosis, but it's caused by ultra-processed food uh, instead of alcohol. 70% of diabetics have it. Um, and uh, Alzheimer's is now considered to be a form of diabetes as well. It's called type 3 diabetes, in case you didn't know. Um, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, and let me ask you something. Um, how many of you know what the word glycation means? Well, not unexpectedly, this is a higher percentage than in most audiences, but um, I didn't know what it was when I first started researching this book. Um, so we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, now, now for the worldwide part. Okay. Ah, thank you. Um, okay, elsewhere in the world, what are we suffering? Uh, this is a paltry little bullet point. Uh, my assistant left off the most important one. In China, the diabetes rate is 70%. 70% this year. Um, I was called by a Chinese physician saying, I've read your book. I think this might help me uh, to help China. And uh, I never heard from him again. <laughs> uh, there's another thing, though, that we need to talk about, and that is that um, third world countries are famous for undernutrition, right? Starvation. Um, this year, it was announced that while the United States has been number one in obesity for you know, a good 20 years since the obesity epidemic was announced in 2000, um, there are now 11 third world countries with higher obesity rates than the United States per capita. Eleven. Um, so, uh, and the estimated death toll, which I'm sure is incorrect, but it's the best that I've seen, uh, direct death toll associated with ultra-processed food, 40 million a year worldwide.
It's not the only craving associated epidemic that we're suffering, particularly in this country. Um, as you probably know, um, opiate addiction has turned even more deadly than, than much more deadly than ever. Um, it used to be rather insignificant in terms of comparative uh, addictions, um, but now it's more than doubled uh, since 2012, um, and it's about 50,000 dying a year. 115 people die every day from opiate overdose. If you don't know why there's an opiate overdose epidemic, I'm going to talk to you about it a little bit. Um, we've legalized cannabis. That's the main reason. So the Mexican drug cartels uh, lost a huge amount of money. Um, and they had to make it up somehow, of course. Uh, and so they began to send, they began to convert the fields to poppies. And they began to send heroin here much, much stronger uh, than people were used to getting on the street. That was, that's one cause of overdose. They've also begun to create these mixes of drugs, including pharmaceutical opiates like fentanyl, um, which are tremendously potent as well. And uh, the result is that people who, for example, uh, became addicted to OxyContin because they did have an injury, um, and had to get off of it because their doctor would no longer prescribe, went to the street and started getting drugs that were much more potent than anyone knew. And really no one could know unless they analyzed every single snort um, or injection. Um, so uh, when I talk about a miracle in terms of craving, um, I'm not limiting it to food, although Food addiction uh, it being the most dangerous, the most deadly, um, the most widespread um, of all the craving associated disabilities is my primary goal here. Um, but my own experience started in the alcohol and drug addiction field, so um, I wanted to share that with you and the fact that the miracle that I was talking about applies to drug addiction as well as food addiction. And then there's internet addiction. We have any number of uh, parents coming to us uh, about gaming, uh, and uh, we have a lovely miracle in store. I don't know how many of you are uh, aware of this because it was a West Coast phenomenon, but there, was, there is a, um, a consultant mostly to Apple who designs apps and things like that. He's very successful, and he designed one called Pause which would turn off cell phones uh, and relieve people of the obsession with checking all the time. And uh, he tried it in a lot of people, they loved it. And he went to Apple to sell it and he sold them any number of gadgets before and they refused to purchase it. He was able to persuade them about the number of people who'd be interested, but why weren't they interested in this one? They were very forthcoming about it. They said, people do not purchase these, um, whatever they call them, uh, for nothing. They are very interested in them and they want to be attached to them all the time and we have a vested interest in that attachment. So now um, we have uh, Apple is our, our dealer, depending on uh, the addictive effects of the technology, which we will talk about a little bit. Um, uh, here's the source of the problem. It looks lovely, right? It's gleaming. We know that, speaking of miracles, uh, the brain is uh, probably it. Uh, but the lights are going out, um, and I'm going to tell you exactly where they're going out and why and what we can do about it. But um, it's important to know that they can be turned back on, and uh, 
gleam for us again. Um, very specifically, the parts of the brain that control our appetite are being dismantled. Um, and we're going to learn about why in a sec. Uh, the, uh, the dismantling of the brain process really relies on uh, something which is a technological term in the food industry. It's called bliss. Uh, and a bliss point technology is actually a um, process by which the food industry determines how successfully any particular product is affecting very specific parts of the brain uh, that produce pleasure. Now, um, how often a year does somebody in this room experience bliss? Um, <laughs> okay, but it's not every five minutes, right? <laughs> ecstasy, these bliss and ecstasy, these are sort of exotic experiences. We'd love to have them, but they weren't, you know, commonplace. Uh, well, they're commonplace now. Uh, and uh, the young lady with her eyes closed, um, biting into the chocolate bar, for those of you who are listening to this tape, um, is experiencing a very successful um, result of bliss point, bliss point technology, which does largely depend on chocolate. Um, I don't know if you know that M&Ms are the number one uh, top-selling candy in the United States. Um, but the effects of M&Ms were, uh, on the brain were measured and uh, its opiate effects were equal to that of opium. Um, there's a very interesting study that was done at the University of Bordeaux. Uh, interesting, lot, all, all of the really juicy studies are done outside of the United States. Uh, we wonder why. Um, and this one found that that table sugar was uh, twice as addictive as cocaine. Does that help explain why we have more than twice as many sugar addicts as we have cocaine addicts? <laughs> yes. Um. Uh, the bliss point won't go away. That's the problem. It just won't go away. <laughs> they're they're on to something and they're not going to let it go. Um, so uh, the products, which I call techno foods with a Z, um, because we've got to distinguish them from food. You know, we talk about the bad foods and the good foods and so forth, but these aren't foods. This is something else. Um, it can be mixed with food, but usually the food is denatured to the point of becoming a white powder, indistinguishable from cocaine powder or uh, any opiate powder. Um, and uh, we call them bliss bombs. I don't know whether they call them that in the industry, but uh, we call them that. And uh, they're, you know, of course, what are putting the real food behind bars. Um, so we're, start, we're going to start to get serious about the definition here. I'm talking about craving, and everybody can uh, identify with craving, but when I talk about addiction, that's where people start to look away. Uh, you know, that only applies to things like heroin, and, you know, whatever. Uh, but in fact, um, the, the brain scientists of the world, the neuroscientists, have been studying the brain and studying what happens as people become addicted to food, alcohol, and drugs, and they found that the exact same things are occurring in exactly the same finite areas of the brain. So the definition of, of addiction now means, whatever the substance involved or behavior, now means that whatever that substance or behavior it is, it powerfully affects and alters our pleasure centers, our brain's pleasure centers, and generates overwhelming cravings. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't generate moderate cravings, too. You know, you can be slightly addicted and you can be hopelessly addicted, um, depending on what happens in your brain. So the 
you know, so the most practical definition of, of addiction is the third thing, and that is continued use despite adverse consequences. So when you think of it in terms of food, I think I've gone over the adverse consequences enough. Um, it doesn't matter. We've now created a deformed, several deformed generations who are accepting of it because they know there's nothing they can do. And we'll get to why dieting has only contributed to the problem instead of solving it shortly. Gosh. It keeps doing this. This is the lady I want you to know about, Nora Volkow, the chief for 20 years of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and Addiction. She is very interested in um, techno foods uh, as drugs. She's an expert, of course, in every other drug substance, but uh, she is telling us that um, at least 60% of the population is formally addicted in terms of the brain function and the uh, loss of control, you know, whether it's mild, moderate, or, or extreme. So that's a lot of people. Um, now, she's a neuroscientist. What about me? You know, how did I get into this? Um, I was a psychotherapist and I thought I was being incredibly innovative by going into a field that was brand new. The first graduate program in my area was teaching about clinical psychology, which is where you talk to people instead of uh, having them lie down and you listen to what they have to say uh, behind them and so forth. And we were wildly creative and we did a lot of great things and a lot of silly things. Um, screaming and so forth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I had the fortune and misfortune to find my first job out of graduate school, actually while I was in graduate school, in an addiction treatment program. And uh, I worked there for eight years inventing, actually, and providing what is now considered standard addiction treatment. We thought it was an incredible, gorgeous creation. Uh, but then we had to take a look at the success rates. Um, we started out treating alcoholics, just alcoholics. They, didn't, they wouldn't even take aspirin, just drank. And we had 50% success. We didn't think that was very good, but not long afterwards, in 1980, when other drugs, other drugs started to in, come in, we realized that 50% uh, was a gorgeous and, and phenomenal success rate with, with substance addiction because then and now, the success rate is 0 to 10%. Food addiction the same way. How many of you know people? Well, I, sh I don't think I'll ask you that question. In most rooms, I would say, how, how many people do you know who have tried to lose weight and gained it back? But uh, in this room, probably not. So uh, in 1980, when I became the director of this program that I had been working in for eight years, um, crack cocaine became an epidemic and we had 100% relapse rates in 24 hours all over the country. People would pay $10,000, which was a huge amount of money at the time, to get into a cocaine-only treatment program. And they would leave after a week forfeiting their money. Uh, that's how terrible the cravings were. Um, so uh, I went into a depression uh, and I think the whole field did, because we realized this beautiful model that we created uh, 
really wasn't working. Um, so if any of you are, are involved in this struggle, you know, whether, uh, whether it's heroin, you know, or you know people who are struggling with meth or whatever, um, and they've been to treatment and they've relapsed, you've got to know that treatment doesn't know what to do with them. I used to give seminars um, about nutrition to my former conventional colleagues once I switched over to, or started adding nutritional strategies. And um, after two years, and none of them came to me. I offered to coach them for free. Nobody came to me. Even though, before I would talk about anything, I would say, before I talk about nutrition, let's talk about why we should talk about nutrition or any other new thing. Isn't what we're doing working really well? Uh, uh, or not? And so I said, when we have all come to an agreement, all of us program directors in this room, about what the relapse rate is, then I will start talking. And finally, after silence, I would let it go on. And finally, somebody would say 90%, and everybody else would not. They didn't want to admit to more than 90%, but they would admit to 90%. So we had something to be depressed about, um, except that it was in the 80s that the miracle arrived. So neuroscience, which was a new science, started really gaining momentum in the 1970s. Um, I have to say that it was heavily funded by the pharmaceutical industry. It was planning the SSRIs long in advance and needed the science. And they needed brain scientists to do the experimentation. You know, did Prozac work at all? Did it work a little bit? Did, you know, where did it work? Did it have any side effects? That sort of thing. But in the process, and there were many uh, scientists, brain scientists, who were not tied to pharmaceutical uh, purse strings, too. So we got lots of great information. And the neuroscientists who were most interested in addiction started coming around uh, touring the United States to let the, the addiction professionals on the ground know what they were up against. So they explained to us that the problem was in the brain and they said, if you're not having any luck, especially with cocaine addicts right now, let me, exp you know, this is why. Of course, we couldn't understand a thing they said. But we got one thing straight, and that was that it, we didn't know anything about it. We were not experts in addiction because we didn't know what, we didn't understand at all about what caused it. And we certainly didn't have any solutions. So we got more depressed. Oh. But fortunately, in the 60s and 70s, we were interested in nutrition. So there were people, uh, even among the brain scientists, who were interested, and I'll, I'll uh, tell you why. Uh, whoop. Uh, let me just uh, pause here for a second before I go on. So what they discovered was that there are only, there are four chemicals made in the brain, four neurotransmitters that affect our appetite, affect our experience of pleasure, that also happen to affect mood, energy, and sleep, our ability to be attentive. Um, these are giant uh, biochemicals, these neurotransmitters, um, in their impact. Um, but there are only four of them. It's not like the entire brain is stacked with chemicals that are ar going awry. There are only four. Um, well, that was sort of good news, but we didn't know what neurotransmitters were at the time. But um, So all of these things, junk foods, opiates, THC, Adderall, the internet, gambling, porn, um, all of them target at least one of the four, and some of them target all four. For example, sugar. For example, pot. Uh, cannabis, pardon me. Uh, <laughs> THC, pardon me. <laughs> um, 
what's the other one I wanted to mention? Well, alcohol. Um, but many of them, for example, heroin primarily targets one, methamphetamine one. Um, and I'll, I'm going to acquaint you with them before we're through here. Um, so uh, let's go to the bottom of this PowerPoint. What, are the, what, are, what, are the, what is junk food doing to the brain? Okay, it's over, over stimulating. That's why we get bliss instead of enjoyment. You know, um, my favorite fruit is apricot. A small, old-fashioned, ripe apricot is my idea of pleasure. Um, but it's not bliss. Um, so in order to achieve bliss, the brain has to be disturbed and depleted. It's literally intoxicated by a toxin. My goodness. You know, we, we, uh, we think of intoxication as kind of fun, right? Uh, no. So, and the final, the final point here is that overexcited initially and then depleted by this exhausting experience that is forced upon uh, the brain cells by the presence of these toxic foods or drugs. Um, now, let's get really down and take a look at what are the substances that need to be combined to create the bliss point. And I'm sure I'm leaving things out because I don't know any food scientists that, that would tell me anything. Uh, so, um, but the top bliss bombs, um, rely for, for, the, for their bliss uh, effect uh, on fructose number one, and we'll talk uh, in a little, a little bit later about what it is about fructose that's more blissful than, than uh, cane sugar. Uh, sucrose is cane sugar, and they're present about 50-50 in foods at this point. You know, um, fructose is really uh, high fructose corn syrup, agave and fruit syrups. Actually, agave and fruit syrups ha have more fructose than corn syrup is, typically has. So um, it's something that I wanted to alert you to. Um, the fruit juice drinks are taking over, but they actually have more fructose than some colas. Although it's a little hard to tell because they don't actually have to say how much fructose uh, on the label at this point. But we have a hero in, uh, in California who, whose research has been funded by Robert Atkins' widow because nobody else would fund it. And what he wanted to do was to analyze bottles of soda, all sorts of soda. He was um, particularly concerned about the um, Latino youth community in Los Angeles. Uh, he's, he's at USC. Um, Michael Gorin is his name, G-O-R-A-N. Look for him because he's very, very careful, very courageous, um, and very unpopular uh, because, <laughs> because he's found out all these uh, ghastly secrets um, about how much fructose is actually in things. You know, you thought old-fashioned cola and Mexican cola was cane sugar. It's not. Um, even though it's on the label. Um, so, uh, starches, um, that would be the ultra-refined variety, whether uh, made from wheat or from gluten-free substances. Um, uh, by the way, refined starch, it doesn't matter where it came from, is uh, associated with high diabetes rates. Um, gluten-free isn't helping when the starch itself is so denatured. Um, okay, chocolate. It, it, chocolate uh, has always been called ancient name, food of the gods. That's better than bliss, even, right? <laughs> uh, now, gluten, as as we'll see, um, has some addictive. Um, 
properties. As a matter of fact, um, there's another term, uh, a more technical term for gluten, and that's um, gluteomorphin. So for some people who can't stop eating bread, whether it's good quality or not, um, we now understand that the morphin part <laughs> is affecting our natural, our endogenous opiate, uh, the uh, endorphins. The same is true for milk products. They contain casein um, and uh, it's a type of casein that's called casomorphin. And I'm one of those people, my entire family are, you know, ice cream every night and uh, unable to stop kind of people. Um, so. I had to go, uh, I think I was about 25 when I realized I just can't have ice cream anymore. It doesn't matter how, what kind of healthy ice cream I eat, I still have a stomach ache and want to throw up. Um, and I quit. So my addiction was there, but it was rather small because I was able to stop. Um, but imagine all the people with stomach aches who can't stop. Um, so fat is naturally... Uh, Opiate-like, mildly, like salt. They're both, uh, you know, essential to life. Uh, so I'm, I'm not disparaging them at all. But when you combine these things, whether healthy or unhealthy together, that have brain impacts, you come out with this progressively magnified effect. Um, and then, of course, caffeine, uh, which has an ancient name sort of like bliss, um, and, uh, and finally, the, the latest additive, uh, cannabis. Um, so a lot of the products that are sold uh, are food products. And in the states that have legalized cannabis, um, they're putting, you know, adding it to sugar in all kinds of products. Do any of you have uh, suggestions of what else? Um, I myself am partial to anything that, uh, or was, uh, that had toasted nuts in it. Um, when you combine fruit, you know, fruit ice cream, dried fruit and things. Um, and then there are the people who were addicted to pe hot pepper, that, you know, like the chili chips and, and things like that. Uh, there's even the vinegar crowd, you know, the, Seem to be addicted to vinegar. <laughs> uh, oops. No, 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 no. Oh. Okay. So now let's get down another step. What are the four parts of the brain? What are these chemicals made in these four parts of the brain, the four different chemicals that each has its own pleasure-producing effect? Each one has its own uh, job as a, an appetite regulator. Um, and they also have special uh, uh, characteristics. Um, for example, I think we know that serotonin is an antidepressant. It's our natural antidepressant. Endorphin is our natural opiate. Uh, dopamine and norepinephrine, they're, uh, they're a little family of stimulants, natural stimulants. They're, it's like our natural caffeine. And GABA is our natural tranquilizer. So it operates the part of the brain that drugs like Valium and Xanax work on. Um, so n there aren't any drugs that work if there aren't neurotransmitters at home when they arrive. So the drugs work by manipulating the neurotransmitters and um, forcing them into super production. Um, there is a fifth factor. So there are four neurotransmitters, but there's another factor that really affects our appetite and, of course, our metabolism. And it has to do with the fact that the brain has a very special blood sugar supply um, and no storage capacity for glucose, you know, the way muscles do. So there has to be uh, food uh, arriving 
of a quality that can sustain 24-hour operation of the brain. And most of us can't do that. Okay. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd give you a, a look, a molecular look at these glorious things. So here's serotonin is known as our inner sunshine. That's why it's, you know, it's antidepressant quality. And this is obviously a radiant uh, looking cell, a molecule rather. Uh, this is endorphin, which is so beautiful and, and in fact gives us our ability to appreciate beauty and, uh, and to have pleasure um, and enjoyment, joy even. Uh, GABA is our natural tranquilizer, so you can see that it, it's, it's a lovely tranquil looking thing. Uh, and finally we have our inner fire, uh, the uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, and, and, and adrenaline. Uh, that give us our energy and ability to focus. And this uh, will give you some idea, you know, of uh, the blood sugar supply that's required throughout the brain uh, at all times. So none of the neurotransmitters work unless there's blood glucose that's fueling their ability to function. Um, so now we've come to the good part. Um, we know a little bit about uh, where cravings come from, where pleasure comes from in the brain. Um, and we know that it's not coming uh, unless we, in, at this time in history, unless we use drugs, drug foods or other drugs, to force a release um, in those areas uh, and give us some temporary pleasure, um, followed by craving, followed by renewed purchase of whatever and uh, a little pleasure again. Um, so what is the nutritional brain miracle? Um, this is it. Um, all, all five of these giant appetite regulators are deep. Each one is dependent on, on one or maybe more, in one case, more than one amino acid. Um, how do we know? This is sort of the uh, most basic biochemical information. Anybody who studies biology seriously knows that certain amino acids fuel certain parts of the brain, just like they know which amino acids are used to make muscle. So these neuroscientists weren't that sharp. You know, this was information that was already there, um, it turned out. But they weren't being paid to get information about how amino acids might be an important clue to improving neurotransmitter function and eliminating addictive cravings. Um, they were on the trail of Prozac and Luvox and so forth. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, um, the amino acids are the building blocks of protein, which really means that everything in the body that isn't water or fat is amino acid based. Protein is really what we're made of, including bone. So it's not just muscle and brain. Um, and, there are 20, and there are 20 of them also. And so, we, we definitely want to eat foods that have all 20, and uh, animal source foods are the only foods that have all 20 um, in high volume. So you might, soy has lots of amino acids. Um, however, um, the volume doesn't compare to the volume available in, in animal products. Um, And of course, we're not eating animal products much anymore. Um, our uh, protein intake overall has dropped by um, a third, which is monumental. It's unthinkable uh, that this basic macronutrient that all of us, it, all of our body and brain is composed of should have uh, dropped, this, the supply in an affluent country should have dropped by 33%. And that when we go into uh, the next um, 
session, we'll be talking about what exactly did we do to make that happen after two million years. It's kind of a fun um, review, actually. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so, uh, you know, p part of it was that we started eating new foods, fat-free foods that, that were uh, loaded with fructose. And fructose, you'll, we'll talk about later, but, you know, it's um, more than twice as sweet as table sugars. It's highly addictive. Um, so who has room for protein? Nobody craves protein because protein creates satiety. The amino acids from protein give the message to the brain and body, you don't need to eat anymore. So it's very convenient that we're not eating protein. It makes a royal road for junk food. Um, and any kind of dieting, low calorie dieting that we do is gonna be deficient in protein, certainly. Um, and then we can't really um, produce some of the cr most cr uh, critical of the neurotransmitters without some amino acids that are made in the, for example, tryptophan that's made in the gut. Um, well, we can't make it anymore because uh, our gut isn't functioning on the kinds of foods that we're feeding it now. And then we have Roundup, which uh, also prevents the utilization of tryptophan, which is, our, which is so essential to our, our mood, our cravings, our appetite, uh, and our sleep. Just to give you a, a little preview. Um, so without these critical amino acids, the brain needs we have the overwhelming cravings, negative moods, fatigue, insomnia, ADHD, and quite a few other things. Um, so when we get back from the break, we'll, do, we'll go into the, um, all of the details of, of how uh, we've broken this craving code, uh, the bliss code, um, to, and how we can rebuild these compromised brain sites um, and, and how quickly we can do it. Um, now, a lot of people, uh, Weston Price people, uh, ask me the question, well, why can't we just do it with food? Well, you probably are. Uh, but if you have such cravings for non-food, that you never get to the food. Um, it doesn't work. We used to be able to do that. We, the first thing we would say to people is, if you want something sweet, have a hamburger patty first or a salmon steak or you know something. Just to have some protein first. And invariably, it worked. They never got to the sweet. They were satisfied. However, that isn't working anymore. People are so much more addicted their brains are so badly compromised from birth now that um, we, don't, we don't see the people who can repair themselves using high protein, you know, whole foods that include high protein foods. Um, but that is where everyone should start. Um, and then uh, the people who cannot do it will get this assistance and the assistance kicks in literally in 24 hours so that then they can eat the high protein foods, the good fats, um, the whole carbs that uh, are really gonna turn everything around. Um, I just told you how quickly, but really it's not, uh, it doesn't take 24 hours. Uh, 1996, we started trialing the amino acids in our office, and we found that they actually took effect in a three to five minutes. Uh, we would have them remove the powder from the capsules, add a little water, swish it around in their mouths, in the salivary uh, tissue. Uh, it's a great delivery system to the brain, and we, would, we and they would see the effects very, very quickly. Uh, which is so heartening to people who are, are so discouraged, understandably discouraged. Um, now, we started using these concentrates, these amino acid concentrates, once we found out which 
amino acids the brain required. And we knew that from the basic brain biology. And then there were studies done by one of the neuroscientists who knew this. Now, thousands of them knew about the amino acids being the primary fuel for the neurotransmitters and that they were capable of repairing the damage wrought by sugars and drugs. But they weren't making that public knowledge because their money depended on, on drug research, basically. Um, but he did it, and um, his studies were started out with cocaine in one of these fancy hospital-based treatment programs with, for cocaine addicts only. He convinced the director to use the amino acid supplements in low doses, actually, um, adequate but low. Um, and at the time, they were experiencing 40% AWOL rates, you know, people coming in and then leaving after a week instead of staying for a month. Um, and he said, well, let's measure that. Let's just see what the AWOL rates are, how they, if they change at all. So we gave them the amino acids that target the part of the brain that's stimulating. I showed you the, 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 fi the inner fire, the dopamine, and the norepinephrine, and the adrenaline. Um, they, the the uh, cocaine addicts were given the nutrients that fed that neurotransmitter system. And uh, at the end of the three-month trial period, their AWOL rate, everyone got the amino acids, their AWOL rate had gone down to 4% from 40%. So when those of us in the field heard about things like this, uh, many of us got very interested. Uh, and, and then, uh, because of something that, um, I'll, I'll just finish this one then, um, that happened that you may or may not know about and we don't need to go into right now, but um, uh, there was a successful campaign to um, frighten people about the use of amino acids, one, one in particular. Um, but now they're coming back again, and I'll tell you why when we come back. Um, and the next step is going to be taking uh, the brain nutrition matching it to the neurotransmitter and hearing about what happens in that three to five minutes or 24 hours. So hope to see you back at the end of the break, which will be in 11 o'clock. <laughs>